Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Pamara, Pamara Jeju. I will be the chair of uh, this session. Our session, as you know, is Seed Battles in Africa, Farmers' Rights, and uh, Greedy Corporates. So we are here under the AFSA session with our members, those who makes uh, AFSA what it is. AFSA is the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. And uh, we work on uh, many issues pertaining to Africa food sovereignty in general. And uh, among those seed is a key issue on which we are working on. And here we are with uh, three of our member organizations. As I said, those who makes AFSA what it is, because of them, AFSA is present in 50 countries out of the 54 of the continent. We'll have three speakers today, one from Western Africa, one from Eastern Africa, and another one from Southern Africa. As you know, seed uh, is key in food production, in Africa, statistics and a lot of research has shown that small-scale farmers are the ones who produce most of the food we consume on the continent. Yet, politics, policies, regulation, and any other pro uh, development program undermine farmers' rights in the seeds would also promote other types of seeds that are threatening, that are weakening our food system. So today, we are going to have uh, some presentation that show you how farmers are resisting corporates taking over our seed system, how we are working on so-called um, GMO issue and related issue, but also some community protocol to save their seeds. The first speaker for today will be Madame Anne Maina. Anne Maina works for Biodiversity and Biosafety Association Kenya, Bullet Biba Kenya. She is the national coordinator of Biba Kenya. She has been actively working on challenging false solutions being pushed in Africa, like genetic engineering, biofuels, the push for a green revolution in Africa, and carbon market as a strategy to cope with climate change in Africa. She has been very instrumental in the growth and development of networks such as the Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum, named as ESAF, part of participatory ecological land use management, another network, and now the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Those are some of the big networks uh, which Anmaina, the coordinator of Biba Kenya, has helped to set up. So today, she will share with us the seed diversity and corporate ca capture of African seeds. So Anmaina, the floor is yours for 10 to 12 minutes maximum to share experiences. But uh, Anne, before you go, I just want to recall how our session will be run. We will go with the three speakers. And we think that uh, within 50 minutes, we will be able to finish the presentation. And that after those presentation, we can have a five minutes kind of pause, then we come back for a 30 minute Q&A. This is how we are going to work. So if you have question, please keep it up to the end so that we will ask the question to all our speakers. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours.
Thank you very much, Famara, and thank you uh, to have the opportunity to share uh, on uh, seed diversity and the corporate capture of African seeds. Um, maybe can we go to the first slide, um, the second slide? So on the outline, I'm going to look at uh, the so-called formal seed system and uh, the problem of uh, the seeds and the seed wars. Then we'll look at the farmer managed seed systems and a few of the policies that are pushed in Africa that are leading to the corporate capture. We have the Africa Continental Seed Harmonization uh, Policy, the harmonization pushed by the regional economic commissions, the plant variety protection laws, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, and some of the principles that are the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, where we are members as Biodiversity and Biosafety Association of Kenya have developed and uh, speak more on uh, some of the concerns and our recommendations. Uh, can we move, please? The next slide. Uh, I'll start off with the issue of the issue of the problem of the seed wars. There's a fierce battle that uh, has been going on in Africa, should I say, for the last at least a decade or more, uh, for the control of African seed systems. And especially uh, private seed industry, which has made has made a lot of gains in sub-Saharan Africa, with numerous private and public interventions and a way to restructure and modernize the so-called uh, seed systems. Key among this is the so-called uh, Green Revolution narrative that has been pushed, uh, which says that our farmers have been uh, practicing uh, traditional or informal seed systems. The other angle uh, is the formal seed systems, which is hinged on formal main stages, variety release, quality control and certification, seed production and seed distribution. And uh, the laws are developed around these seed systems and they are termed the formal seed systems. The other one where the farmers uh, do not follow this sequencing in their seeds and food production has, of, has been referred to the informal, as the informal seed systems and uh, no recognition has been put for the age old practices of farmers practicing. But we are coming up uh, and as uh, under the Alliance for Food Sovereignty platform, we have come up with the farmer managed seed systems and uh, rejecting the so-called informal seed systems where farmers seed sovereignty we see is under a lot of threat from national and regional legislation. For example, the uh, UPOV 91 uh, compliant ARIPO protocol for the protection of new varieties of plants demonstrates a clear bias towards commercialization of plant genetic resources and restricts the age old practice of African farmers to freely save, use, share and sell their seeds. Uh, a lot of research done has shown that at least over 90% of farmers in Africa have been practicing uh, the so-called informal seed system. And uh, one of the uh, maybe uh, policies that I want to look at is what the, the so-called Africa Continental Seed Harmonization Policy that aims to harmonize seeds across the African continent. And uh, some of the people who do not understand this might ask, uh, but harmonization is good so that when you produce seed, you can sell it uh, in Uganda, in Tanzania, in uh, in Rwanda and other countries. Um, and uh, the push by this is uh, that it will adapt common quality assurance protocols. And of course the multinational corporations and the seed companies are aiming to have a cheaper process of selling their seed. Uh, yet we, we, we have over 90% of the seed in the African continent uh, under the farmer managed seed systems. And that's one of the uniqueness of uh, this uh, farmer managed seed systems where uh, we have diversity, which is very important even in terms of nutrition and uh, can provide a big base for food and nutritional security for African population. The African continental seed harmonization focuses exclusively on markets and industrialization. And some of the uh, concerns that we have are uh, articulation on farmers' rights and agricultural biodiversity, because the, the African continental seed harmonization policy is essentially following the same path as other regional economic, com econom economic commissions like the East African communities that needs that wants to standardize focusing on industrial seed, which uh, are very much intertwined with the excessive use of synthetic agrochemicals and of course the toxic pesticides. 
minimum and poorly paid labor who produce uh, en masse and cheap, a uh, lot of land use change and uh, ecological simplification, which is a threat to biodiversity uh, uh, in the African continent. And this has re resulted in widespread soil infertility, displacement of locally adapted and uh, adaptable seed, loss of agricultural biodiversity, and uh, pollution in many cases, uh, accelerating issues of food and nutrition security, where uh, a lot of the foods are limited to maize or cassava, and not much uh, diversification as in uh, like looking at the sorghum, the millet and others to ensure food security. Globally and across the continent, we are witnessing extensive calls for a rapid re reorientation of agriculture uh, food systems towards more agrobiodiverse uh, systems which are embedded in local seeds and food systems due to the corrosive effect that we've seen in changes in seed laws that are more uh, intertwined or looking towards industrialization and a push for a green revolution in Africa, which is a, a big threat to food and nutrition security and future food production in Africa. And at the regional economic commissions, we've seen harmonization of seed marketing and trade laws in the regional economic uh, com communities and commissions. For example, the economic community of West African states, COMESA, SADAC, and the East Africa community. The aim is to ensure the free flow of certified seed within and between the regional economic commissions. And the RECs are key drivers for industrial transformation towards industrialized farming systems and expanded seed markets for the seed industry. And of course, as I said, the harmonization efforts are hinged on four aspects, which are variety release, registration, um, variety testing, registration, seed certification, phytosanitary measures. Next slide, please. Then we have the plant variety uh, protection laws that have been of also have been pushing for this corporate capture of African seeds and this govern intellectual property. Uh, most notably, we have the Africa Regional Intellectual Property Organization, ARIPO, and the Africa Intellectual Property Organization, OAPI and the ESC as well, which is moving towards uh, developing harmonized biosafety laws and seed laws to further this uh, extravicist agenda. And uh, the industrial food systems have had devastating ecological and social impacts, especially when you look at the COVID impact, the COVID pandemic, other shocks that are hitting Africa. We have the fall armyworm, the desert locust invasions, and uh, a lot of diseases like uh, the maize lethal necros necrosis diseases that have led to a lot of changes and the interaction with climate leading to a lot of degradation, uh, which would would not be the impact would not be so big if we had more diversity and less harmonization. Then we have the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. The ACFTA was founded in 2018, coming in effect in 2019. Uh, 54 of the 55 African Union states have signed the agreement. And uh, the, the, the ACFTA is embedded in the Africa Union Agenda 2063, which requires member states to remove tariffs from 90% of goods, yet is still under negotiations. And the ACFTA has created greater impact as for inter-Africa trade as a, as a central driver to industrialization in the continent. Uh, with this in mind, the AU has the Africa Seed and Our Technology Program, ABSP, uh, and then back to on a mission to establish the Africa continental seed harmonization policy as a large percentage of the transactions are under the ACFTA in the continent and cross border trade commodity movement, which uh, may look good, but it's all about uh, uh, having a standardized system, moving uh, products uh, cheaply and uh, uh, similar products in the continent. But the prioritization of the regional value chains may be an improvement on global value chains, but this does not help in itself address a number of critical factors in terms of ecological sustainability, biodiversity, social equity, and escalating poverty and hunger. Next slide, please. 
But as the Alliance of Food Sovereignty in Africa, we have uh, developed uh, what we call the former managed seed system regime, which is hinged on several aspects. And the implementation of this framework is graded uh, under these principles. The issue of sovereignty of peoples over plant genetic resources and in their national territories managed by national and, and states' responsibilities. With the push for corporate capture or corporate uh, uh, um, control of African seed, we will lose our sovereignty and control of our seed. Once you lose control of our seed, you lose even, you have challenges in terms of uh, states ensuring that their community, their, 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 their residents or so the people living in those countries are able to control their food. The other principle is a recognition of past, present and future roles of farmers, including especially women in the development of agricultural biodiversity. Uh, the other principle is the equity of farmers, regardless of their origin, gender, ethnicity before the law and the participation of farmers in decision making in the agriculture sector and particularly in the seed subsector. Uh, the farmers have had age old practices where they have saved, uh, selected and uh, kept their seed and improved them over time. And this is very important uh, in their decision making. The issue of the free, the free prior and informed consent for farmers for any decision concerning access to genetic resources available in their communities uh, is very important because uh, with the genetic resources, uh, farmers are able to control even their, their, their resources and make money from that. And the recognition of all the rights recognized under the relevant international instruments, for example, the UN Drop 2018. Next slide. Uh, another aspect uh, I want to highlight under the, uh, the farmer managed seed system uh, structure that we have developed under the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is farmers have the freedom to collect, adapt, and adapt rules dedicated to guaranteeing the quality of farm, farm seeds and the, and the release within their collectives. And this we suggest that uh, farmers can be able to control, uh, can be trained and be able to control and have autonomy on the issues of uh, germination, sanitary, agronomic quality, organoplatic quality taste, and other uh, quality deemed relevant by the farmers. Of course, this is to work with the uh, relevant phytosanitary uh, uh, agencies to ensure that happens. In terms of quality assurance, farmers are free to establish quality assurance rules for the seeds they select, save, and circulate in their seed system. This quality assurance may include, without being limited to the following elements, a common vision, uh, the concerned farmers belong to the same organization, collective or a local network with close ties and common principles and values. And then the principles of trust, equality, transparency based on commitment signed by the farmers through a charter or type of collective agreement, uh, collectively defined rules, verification mechanism, a label and participation in collective learning. And this we see is very important because a lot of times uh, we get a lot of criticism that farmers cannot be able to guarantee quality and sanitary uh, concerns that have been raised. But this is something that's possible. Uh, when you look at some of this, uh, what I've talked about and the corporate capture of African seed, the focus often has been on cash crops uh, leave farmers as price takers in highly volatile commodity markets. And we have seen this with our um, so-called cash crops in Africa. We have the coffee, the tea, uh, the cocoa, and all that. We produce, sell it cheaply, it's processed in the West, and uh, fetches much more than what farmers have been able, have spent in terms of uh, uh, producing the products. You also find the push for the harmonization of African seeds through various uh, laws and all these uh, mechanisms, even under the regional economic commissions, is hinged and uh, is a build up towards the pushing of genetically engineered effects crops in Africa. And we have seen a lot of issues coming up in Kenya of the corporate capture with GMOs being pushed just this, uh, like an hour ago, our president was giving a speech and was saying that GMOs is what the way to go. Uh, we have been very instrumental and spoken out against it as Biba Kenya, the biodiversity and biosafety of Kenya. And this is something that we stand for. Then dangerously, when you situate the 
farmer managed seed systems and farmers' rights within the context of a commercial seed sector agenda is very dangerous because uh, farmers will not have control. And at the end of the day, it is the corporate or the green revolution agenda that wants to control the seed. And when you control the seed, you control the food. And then rushing into indecent haste is a hugely problematic process. And uh, there's importance that we have uh, more democracy to avoid a situation where we lose uh, control of our seeds. Uh, some of the recommendations we make, it's important to promote African interests over that of global commodity value chains and corporate interests with, with Africa leading the way and redefining the future of agriculture built on dignified livelihoods, ecological integrity, African unity, and there's need to move beyond the simple recognition of farmer managed systems through implementation of farmers' rights to restore agriculture landscape and use them as a vehicle for developing suitable agriculture systems for the African continent, and then allocate adequate institutional and other resources to support farmer managed seed systems on a sustainable basis, particularly in the context of a changing climate, rapid urbanization, agriculture extraction, and widespread ecological degradation. Also, uh, if there's need for alternative farmer managed seed system policy that outlines quality assurance and quality control standards, and we have begun that under the AFSA platform. Registration sometimes exposes farmers, uh, save farmer managed seed system to biopiracy. Ownership, access, and benefit sharing is very important that that is uh, farmers are protected. And the law should provide for protection of farmer managed seed system data in databases. Uh, registration of farmer managed system should not be mandatory, uh, but uh, encouraged. Um, then value for cultivation, use, VUS and DUS, distinct, uniform, and stable need not to be mandatory, but you need to focus on quality assurance, control, like germination, moisture content, pest, and disease free. Then you also have to have legally binding measures uh, to ensure the implementation and realization of farmers' rights in all legislation to deal with the issues of farmers' rights that are understood under all these laws, for example, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas, Yon Drop, ensure and, ensure and assure the rights of farmers and particularly the rights of women farmers, and there's need for comprehensive and appropriate national and regional seed policies that accommodate all small-scale farmers' activities, ensure adequate seed is available for local production, and protect agricultural biodiversity by supporting ecological farming. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope we can have more discussions uh, after this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Really appreciate, especially the last uh, picture as well. So uh, yes, I will come back to you later for the Q&A session. Now we are going for uh, Olua Femi's presentation. Yes, Olua Femi's topic is small scale okay. agroecological producers facing the intellectual property stream holder, stream holder. The case of Benin with the UPOV 91 initiative and the non renewal of the mora moratorium on GMOs. Who is Oluwafemi? Oluwafemi has eight years of experience in agroecology. A small scale agroecology producer in Benin. He is a social entrepreneur, manager of the startup EcoCity and the executive director of the organization called Les Jardins de l'Espoir or Gardens of Hope. He is active in several sub-regional networks such as the West African Community for Peasant Seeds, and continental networks such as AFSA. His main, his main activity is the production of agroecological fruits and vegetables. In this sense, he develops farmers' markets through production of agroecological uh, production of short distribution channels to improve the, inc the income of farmers. The Eden Farmers Market, which is held 
every fortnight in the Grand Nukwe area of, Benin, of Kotonou, the capital city of Benin, is an, an example of this. And uh, I also know that he is very, very active and uh, uh, energizing the youth in agricultural sector, namely in agroecology. So, uh, Oluwafemi, I'm very pleased to meet you here again, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Famara. Uh, I'm also very happy to be uh, here presenting and have you uh, as a moderator for this session. Um, so my name is Olua Femi Kotuni, and, um, and I'm part of the agroecology movement uh, in West Africa, uh, especially in, in Benin. And by the way, I just want to jump on this uh, opportunity to uh, inform uh, each and everyone here that um, in the coming month of March, from the 9th to the 11th of March, uh, Benin will be hosting uh, the biggest uh, peasant event uh, in West Africa, which is the West African uh, Peasant Seed Affair. Uh, so uh, this will see the participation of more than 20 countries uh, from Africa, from Europe, and we expect from uh, Latin America. So. Uh, this is the, the like I mean the the formal invitation uh, the virtual invitation so I hope uh, uh, we hope to see you all here in Benin uh, and by by this time we're going to talk about um, let's say the specific case of Benin um, in the struggle uh, for peace and rights um, I wish I could uh, keep going in English but I, I will shift to the French language. Uh, because many people are watching back home in Benin, and uh, uh, I think uh, to make it uh, more uh, digest. So we are going to speak today of the rights of a small agroecological uh, producers and the specificity of Benin where, with the initiative of uh, UPAV 91 and the non-renewal of the moratories on GMOs. So as a first information, Benin is a country of 13 million inhabitants in Western Africa near Nigeria that has uh, a Agriculture represents 70% of employment in the country and 36% of the GDP and exports uh, represent 75 to 90% of the production because in Benin, uh, we are second producers of cotton in Africa. Uh, the a very important producer of cashew in the world, fourth exporter of pineapples on the African continent. So you can have an idea that it is an economy that is very much concentrated in agriculture. And most of these, most so most of the exports of the country come from the agricultural sector. You can see that the first profile is rural agriculture, large scale agriculture uh, as corn and other cereals represent 60%. And then we have uh, the urban and peri-urban agricultures that mostly produce vegetables. Uh, they only represent a 10%. And then we have uh, rent agricultures who are based on pineapple and fruit and others that represent 30%. So the population in Benin of the 13 million, around 6.5 million who are agricultures, who are farmers. So our population is truly a farmer's population. And mo the average size of lots is about 3.5 hectares. An example in France, uh, the average is 60 hectares. So just to give you an idea that essentially we have small farmers, even when they are 
producing uh, for exports like pineapple and cashews and others, uh, we are mostly a country of small producers and 700,000 of hectares available are uh, and only 4% of these uh, production is regulated. So of this, these 6 million, we have uh, about some people who also have animals. So this is a profile of uh, the farmers in Benin. I wanted to uh, focus on the fact that these are small producers of farmers who have to fight for their rights. What is interesting is that within this small agriculture, the organization of the market is actually quite dynamic. So, and especially within the subsistent agriculture. So you've actually got an agriculture that has a lot of intermediaries. So between the field and the market, you can find a lot of these intermediaries. And this is not a new structure in terms of the commercial agriculture. We also have intermediaries, exporters namely, but sometimes the producers themselves are also exporters. And so it's small scale exports. And this is something that we need to underline. And in the sector of urban and peri-urban agriculture, we also have intermediaries, but we have more and more, and this is something you can see on the photos actually, that that's, this is me and my colleagues. We have more and more farmers markets where agri-ecological producers organize and uh, sell their produce directly. So this model uh, that has been stable for the last 60 years is, is very stable. Uh, it's turned towards capital and the market, but it is a stable model in which um, peasants can decide, uh, um, save and select their seeds for um, um, several seasons. And so despite several attempts uh, by the ministry, um, the uh, farmers still have a degree of freedom in terms of uh, commercializing their um, uh, seeds. And that is a system that has been in place for a long time. So this dynamic led Benin to ratify a certain number of uh, conventions and treaties. You can see this on the screen. So we have the Conver Convention for Biodiversity in 94, the Kyoto Protocol in, 20 in 2002, the Cartagena Protocol in 2005 on, the, on biotechnological risks. And this allowed the country to um, vote a law uh, 16 years later in 2021 on these risks. Benin is also a stakeholder in the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So this is very important. This participation of, the, of Benin in UN DROP and Indigenous People. So here you can see a certain number of tools within the um, um, legislative toolbox of Benin that has allowed the model that I presented earlier to uh, be so stable. It's very important. And you can see it here and it has continued in this way until the beginning of the 2000s. Benin following this driving force and following uh, the um, the will of the administration of the government and of uh, multinational corporations gmos has become uh, have become sorry a a recurring question in benin and this is i would like to take this opportunity to really uh, salute the ongoing work of the civil society because thanks to their activism we have uh, been able to understand in Benin that we were not ready, we didn't have sufficient information about these GMOs to be able to adopt them straight away. So there's been a lot of work that's been carried out throughout the years, especially in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And this work 
ha brought uh, the Ministry for Agriculture to vote a five-year moratorium on GMOs. And that was the first time that it happened on the African continent. And to my knowledge, Benin with France and Switzerland is one of the rare countries on the planet to have voted a moratorium on uh, GMOs. There are other countries, but uh, it's quite exceptional. And this moratorium was in fact renewed in 2006 uh, until 2012. So Benin actually voted this 10 years of moratorium on the use of GMOs. And as you can see on screen, this allowed us to um, implement a national committee for biosecurity in collaboration with several ministries. And so this work really follows a um, um, multi-stakeholder approach, uh, bringing in um, governmental actors, but also civil society. So we can say that things were going quite well until things got a little more complicated around 2008. You know, you must understand that Benin begins, belongs to a sub-regional um, uh, space, which is ECOWAS. And following the um, predictions of ECOWAS, the decisions taken by this organization are now supranational. And this means that their decisions present an obligation to certain countries. So certain texts are voted in the legislative toolbox and then forces certain country to adopt certain dispositions um, to be able to conform with the decisions that were taken at the regional level. And at that moment, this really started a new movement. And so here you can say that the ECOWAS uh, decided to vote a text on the harmonization of seeds within the region. And so Benin had to follow, and from this point on, things started to get more complicated. But in 2012 already, um, our moratorium was not renewed. So here you can see that seeds are, so this um, uh, text is directly applicable. And so that means that um, the, any leg legislative decision taken by the country that is not um, um, in, that does not conform to regional texts is uh, now put into question. And now ECOWAS is now forcing states to um, uh, adopt certain laws to be, um, to observe uh, regional regulations. And this really hides or barely hides an attempt to privatize a lot of the rights of the member countries. And so this treaty in quite an explicit way says that from now on, we need to accept that the private sector is now a major actor of seed management, which was not the case in Benin until then. And so since 2012, Benin did not renew the moratorium, which is worrying. And then in 2018, as we could really expect, Benin decided to uh, adhere to UPOV 91, um, and this directly goes against all uh, previous dispositions that protected farmers' rights. And here I would like to really uh, underline the reactivity and the reactiveness and the um, dynamism of civil society that refused um, to submit and really organized to try and obstruct this attempt to uh, make Benin adhere to UPOV 91. I've only got a few minutes left, left, so I need to accelerate. And so farmers really mobilized in order to uh, face this issue. But as you could expect, the state did not back down either. 
the state persevered and so um, the farmers didn't stop either. They um, launched an, uh, an opposition law. Unfortunately, uh, my time is up, but I can um, share this document with whoever would be interested in reading it. But for the first time, and once again, Benin is quite exceptional on this front. Um, in um, suggesting this law that was against UPOV 91. And this is a law that is based on all the treaties and the conventions and the legal toolbox that I mentioned earlier. And this is quite interesting because you can see this law will be voted next Sunday and we really hope that this law is gonna go through. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, say everything I wanted to say, but thank you very much for your attention. Olua Femi, you can read um, your recommendations slide if you want to. I do not have a recommendations. I have a summary, but I do not have uh, recommendations. No problem. Thank you very much, Olua Femi. I'm so sorry uh, that the time has run out. It's very, very interesting. But our friend Bright would uh, suffer if I didn't stop you. We only have 20 minutes left. So I do want to give um, the floor to Bright. Which is about, sorry, it's about piloting community protocols and ordinances to facilitate and secure peasants' right to seed and food. This presentation will be done by our friends from Malawi, Bright Firi, our lawyer. Happy to see you with the smile. Bright is a distinguished environmental advocate who has played leading roles for civil society at national and regional levels related knowledge on issue of farmers' rights, environmental rights and justice, biodiversity, traditional knowledge, and intellectual property. Seed law, plant variety protection, and access and benefit sharing. He holds a Master of Environmental Law degree obtained from Vermont Law School in addition to a bachelor's degree in environmental policy. At the mean point in time, Bright is working for Commons for Eco-Justice in Malawi and is a key member of the Civil Society Agrarian Partnership. And also Bright, is a very good uh, advisor within the Alliance for Food, for Food Sovereignty in Africa. He's uh, leading or initiating a pool of lawyers who will be advising AFSA on uh, any issue related to law on uh, food in general, food sovereignty, land issue, and so on. So Bright, I'm also very happy to have you here. Uh, you have uh, 15 minutes, so I think you can share your experience and thought here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Famara, um, and thank you very much, everyone. Good evening. Um, in this presentation, um, we are going to discuss much more about uh, what we are calling um, as community protocols and also ordinances. Um, and this is because um, as AFSA, you know, over the years, we've been firefighting a lot about hostile imaging, um, um, both regional and national uh, seed trade laws and also plant variety protection laws. Um, AFSA has been very key um, to contest the Arusha protocol on plant variety protection. Also, uh, the SADIC uh, PVP protocol. Recently, we have just engaged with the African Union Commission on the continental guidelines on the harmonization of our seed um, regulatory frameworks. And so if you look at all our tra uh, track record of uh, what we've been dealing with uh, over time, much of it is about marginalization of farmers' rights, um, omission, um, and um, limiting the space of farmers, you know, to um, exercise the customary rights to seeds. So in this presentation, basically it's um, hinged much more on um, what are the safeguards that communities have 
um, in terms of uh, making sure that they've got also bargaining power, uh, despite the fact that there are all these um, emerging inter, uh, regional and national uh, seed and uh, PVP frameworks. Um, and so I'll make much more reference to um, the, uh, the international agreements, such as the Nagoya Protocol, um, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. I'll also talk much about uh, other um, instruments, um, MOXTO uh, guidelines, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Peasants and other people working in rural areas, and also the UNDRIP. Uh, just to make sure that, you know, we look at all those um, instruments, international agreements, and what they say about safeguards on, uh, for communities uh, with respect to seeds. Um, and so um, for, the, for the Nagoya Protocol, you know, just from the onset, uh, the negotiations were done in the spirit of marginalizing communities um, over control of biological and genetic resources. You know, uh, at the onset uh, of the discussions for the Nagoya Protocol, governments in the scheming of that protocol positioned themselves that they should be the ones making decisions on behalf of communities. They regarded communities as not organized, they regarded the communities that they do not have effective decision-making structures regarding the management of their genetic resources, including seed. So from the onset, governments wanted to play the role of negotiating and providing consent on behalf of communities on all matters relating to ownership and control of biological and genetic resources. Next slide. So um, the Nagoya Protocol, um, basically, if you can go one slide be, uh, just behind, please. One slide before that one. Yes, that one, thank you. So the Nagoya Protocol is basically a supplementary agreement to the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, and, oh, and so it, it rests on three pillars, access, benefit sharing, and compliance. And we, as we go down, we'll look at all these uh, three pillars. Uh, and we are going to discover that in all these three, three pillars, the emphasis is benefit sharing concerning states. So the, the Nagoya Protocol as, a, as a, an international instrument or an international agreement is mainly concerned with benefit sharing between states, you know? But good enough, it includes two potential safeguards to safeguard the rights of communities, to give communities some bargaining power. And this is com about community protocols and also free, free or informed consent. Next slide, please. And so if we now look at those three um, uh, pillars, access, compliance, and benefit sharing, they are all hinged um, or they are all much more articulated under Article 5.5 of the protocol, Article 6.2 of the protocol, and also Article 7 of the protocol. The good part of, about the Nagoya protocol is the language that they are using. You see, they use the word mostly uh, shall instead of may, um, as we, we may now try to compare with other international agreements like the uh, plant treaty. In the Nagoya protocol, much of the language is much more encouraging. They're using shall, can, the, the party shall do one, two, three. The party shall undertake A, B, C, D, E. So it's much more encouraging. But all these are hinged about member or party, contracting parties, what contracting parties are supposed to do, not necessarily what communities are supposed to do. And so we have Article 5.5, Article 6.2, and Article 7, all giving emphasis on what the contracting parties shall do or shall legislate, you know, with respect to uh, genetic resources 
and the transactions associated with the movement and sharing of genetic resources. Next slide, please. And so um, other than the Nagoya protocol, um, those two safeguards we mentioned about, community protocols and also the free prior informed consent, um, can also be uh, can also have a root or can have um, some footprint within the UNDROP uh, framework. So under Article 19 and, and, and also under Article 31.1, there is more pronouncements about what member states should do, you know, in cooperation with uh, custodians of genetic resources, basically the communities, so that by the end of the day, these communities have got a bargaining power, you know, to control or to have a say on, on, their, on their resources. So Article 19, basically, it, it provides that states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with indigenous people's consent through their own representative institutions in order to obtain free, free informed consent. One of those safeguards we mentioned about. And Article 31.1, it also encourages indigenous peoples, you know, to exercise their right to maintain, control, protect, and develop, you know, uh, sciences, local, you know, uh, traditional sciences, technologies, cultures, um, so that all that um, is to the good uh, of the management and uh, improvement of genetic resources, seeds, medicines, so that at least they have uh, they derive some uh, incentives. Uh, from the conservation of, of, of such. Next slide, please. And so those uh, three, um, the three uh, pillars, which is uh, access, benefit sharing, and also um, uh, compliance. In terms of access, basically the access is subject to uh, the Pre informed consent of the provider country. And that pre informed consent is also derived from the communities. Next slide, please. And uh, the other pillar on benefit sharing obligations for contracting parties. Uh, basically, with the, that pro the protocol specifies that it is the benefits arising from the utilization of the genetic resources as well as subsequent applications and commercializations and commercializations that are to be shared. So it basically, you know, zeroes in on what are the key elements that should be looked at in terms of sharing of, uh, of, of, of benefits. Um, so it's basically the utilization part, that utilization aspect, as well as any other um, benefits from the commercialization of such genetic resources. Um, and so, um, for the benefits to be shared, the provider and the user of the genetic resources must negotiate an agreement known as MAT, mutually agreed terms. And these benefits can be monetary, they can also be non-monetary, such as loyalties and the sharing of research results. Next. Uh, and the last part of the pillar uh, concerning compliance, the protocol just creates specific obligations to support compliance with the domestic legislation. So basically country specific um, uh, legislative measures or regulatory requirements of the party providing the genetic resource. And also in addition, uh, there's a system of mon monitoring the utilization of the genetic resource which is being undertaken. Uh, and also uh, the protocol provides at least uh, checkpoints in order to monitor the utilization of genetic resources. Uh, but when we talk about um, the protocol itself, it ensures that the prior informed consent of local communities uh, retains the mandate of these communities to decide whether to permit use of their knowledge or the genetic resource. Next slide, please. And so the discussion brings us to the uh, key theme, which is the community protocols. 
Um, and when we talk about com of community protocols, we are simply talking about, you know, the end product is a, is a document, but this is about expressions, articulations, rules and practices generated by the communities to set out how they expect other stakeholders to engage with them. Okay, so a community protocol is basically, you know, a, a, a rule or a charter of principles. It is part of a, of, of a customary role, you know, um, and it basically affirms the right of the you know, communities to be approached according to some set standards on, on you know, on, on how they can negotiate with any other interested parties on things that are under their custodianship. Next slide, slide please. So with respect to community protocols, it starts with a declaration of the community to basically um, demonstrate commitment uh, and also to collectively assert their rights over local plant genetic resources. So it is just a declaration at first. It can be in the form of a joint affidavit, a resolution, or pronouncements by the community leadership. And uh, why this uh, pronouncement? The pronouncement is just there to serve as an expression of solidarity with uh, neighboring communities. And it also um, alerts state institutions to recognize this protocol development initiative. Uh, and so it's the communities that decide which information to include in the protocol based on what they consider as important and necessary assets, public claim to genetic resources. Next slide, please. Um, so once the, com the committee has uh, made that pronouncement and uh, they have uh, put down in writing what they want to protect, they come up with uh, basically a community catalog. So it's a catalog of uh, what is to be contained uh, or what is available in their community that they think is valuable to be protected or um, which accounts for uh, measures that have to be included within the uh, set terms of uh, ne uh, negotiations. Uh, and so this is at the community level. But then the community takes this uh, tool or the catalog to uh, local government um, institutions, you know, local government structures to recognize or, or state government institutions, state government structures to recognize what they have put down um, or what, what their inventory is. And once it is taken to the, to the local government level, now the local government it generates what is called an ordinance. So an ordinance is basically an instrument, it is a legal instrument at a district level generated by uh, uh, local government structures informed by what the communities have put up to be, to be, to be part of their resources, or inventory or, or materials, things that they want to, to talk about to say, this is part of our, our, our jurisdiction and we want to protect this. So the local government authorities, they simply generate ordinances and it is these ordinances that now spell us out the rules and responsibilities, which the committees have set out for their legal, uh, legally recognized customary rights on seeds or food. And both community, both, um, community protocols and ordinances, they are strong enough to contest plant variety protection. I said at the beginning that we've been, you know, firefighting uh, regional protocols, but even without that, if communities can have ordinances, if they can have uh, community protocols, they can be able to contest PVP, they can be able to contest hostile seed, um, seed laws. Um, the advantage about both ordinances and community protocols is that they are also you know, through these instruments, you can be able to track movement of plant genetic resources for food and, uh, for food and agriculture. Um, sometimes when communities conduct seed fairs, 
gene banks just come and collect what they have uh, discovered to be of value to them without any formal, formal transfer mechanisms. But through community protocols and through ordinances, the gene banks are now liable or obliged to use material transfer agreements before they can take anything that is being displayed at the seed fairs. Next, please. Yeah, so, so to sum it up, um, community protocols uh, is a very good way to broaden understanding of farmers' knowledge uh, of breeding and also to make sure that they have got bargaining power on what they have um, within their communities and they can be able to exercise freely you know, um, the key elements of farmers' rights, which is to save, exchange, share, sell farmers' seeds. Thank you so much. Uh, I encourage you to um, seek more clarity with me uh, during um, plenary. Uh, I'm still around uh, for any other things because these things are very technical. I can be able to clarify um, during plenary. Thank you so much. <laughs>